So today we're looking at some Advanced Dungeons and Dragons first edition and we're going to be talking about a topic that really tests the Dungeon Master and what the Dungeon Master has planned for his or her campaign. So the area that we're looking at today, if I can pull this out, the field of magical research. We might also touch on uh, some holy water creation for the clerics, but primarily we're going to be looking at spell research, fabrication of magic items including potions and scrolls. So potions, scrolls, items and spells. So there they go. That's what we're looking at today. And we shall begin. But first, we just have to touch up. Go back and uh, talk about a... Just to get back to a topic. So a lot of what we're looking at is going to be about magic users. But it does equally equate to clerics, druids, and illusionists as well. Although it is done a bit differently. The focus on magic users is that the, the poor magic user may not have all the spells. And this is where we have to retouch on here and work out exactly what it is that the DM's doing with spell casting and spells. If using this particular chart, then the DM is saying that you need to find spells, you have a minimum number of spells per level and a maximum number of spells per level. Now if you're having to find spells, you may not find the spell that you want. And if you've got a certain type of intelligence, you're limited by what spell level. So you may also be not be able to get that particular spell that you really, really desire because it's outside of your ability. If you've got a 15 intelligence, you're up 7th level spells. But if you're trying to look at what's on the 8th and the 9th level, and you think, well, I really want one of those, but you don't, because you don't have the intelligence for it, you have to make things work, which is what we do. So that's why we have to revisit what the DM decides to do with spells. So, we'll have a quick look at um, some of the spells and we'll go back to having a look at the anatomy of a spell. So these are the spells for the magic user. Again, as I said, we're talking to the magic user primarily because the way the clerics get their spells is through Divine Favor and they can still make spells but they're they have access to spells a little bit differently. And same too with the illusionists. But illusionists also suffer from the same caveat as magic users in that they have to find spells. If that's what the magic user, if that's what the dungeon master does. So depending on your intelligence, you may want to do something that's beyond your understanding. So how do you do it? you have to make your own spells, which comes back to spell research. There's a couple of reasons, well, a few reasons why we do spell research. It's because the magic user doesn't have that spell. For instance, if the magic user hasn't found a spell for fireball or lightning bolt then he or she may decide to make a fireball or lightning bolt spell in which case it's right here it's a third level spell and everything works out from there and just like anything else they've already got the specifics laid out 
if you're not changing anything, it's all good. If you want to start making changes, that's when levels start to change. So if you alter the fireball to make it a faster casting time or a further area of effect during, or a longer range and so on, then it might be a fourth level spell rather than a third level spell. But as it is, it's in this column, it stays there if you do everything exactly like that. So that's reason one for magic user making spells. They haven't found the spell that they're actually wanting to use. The other reason, or another reason, is that they want to combine two or three. To take evil, to take invisibility, and to take magic. Put it all in the same spell. So two second level spells and a first level spell. That's when you want to start combining effects. Which is all good. You're allowed to do that. Research your new spell. Work with the DM. Figure out what the specifics are. And something like that might be easily a fifth level spell. Because it has so many different effects. And this is where working with the dungeon master is key. The moment you start to deviate from here, then you need to work with the DM to work out what it is that you are actually trying to research. And then there's the third type of research. That's a brand new spell. We see examples of brand new spells when we look at uh, Morden Canaan, Learmond, Tensor, and that's what we're looking for. Put your own, insert your own character's name there, create your whole new spell. And that's when you need to really look at this and work with the DM with what you think as a player, to what the DM thinks as a DM, and then come to some sort of compromise. And work out what the specifics are. And so on. Of course, you're making your own spell, so you don't need to worry about the intelligence chart. If you find a spell, you have to roll on the percentage if that's what your dungeon master is doing and this is what it's all specific about what is the dungeon master up to and how do they work out magic we haven't even discussed things like uh, spell books and the different types of spell books but generally if the dm is running with this then these percentages you're going to be looking at wanting to do your own spell research. So let's have a quick look at what it takes to research a spell. All of this in the magical research section is where the DM earns his or her money. Okay, so spell research. Slabs of text but curiously, it's actually quite comprehensive. It actually explains things and makes things happen. Sort of explains what I've already just discussed in that you've got the different types of spell requirements of I haven't got the spell, found the spell, I want to combine two spells, oh, it's a brand new spell. And it always comes down, to, by the way, time and money. So the time of everything is that you're looking at weeks per level so it's important to work out what the level of the spell is going to become. Especially if you're working at a brand new spell, then the DM's got to really work out based on what the other spells are like and how balanced or imbalanced. Because the player's obviously got an idea of what they want to do with the spell. You, uh, clerics and druids can still create their own spells and do everything else, but it's just that um, they've, got, they've got easier access to the full list of spells. So their need to create new spells is um, generally 
it, it's their need is usually a lot less. But the magic user who has to greedily find things, well, that's different. Okay, so time we're talking about weeks per spell level, which is fine. We love that. And then you've got the cost. So the initial cost is 200 gold pieces per spell level per week. And that's assuming that you have a fully stocked library, a fully stocked research center, all the ingredients, all the components, and it's a lovely environment for you to work in. Then as things are missing from that equation, costs go up. So to the point where if you've got absolutely nothing and you're making it all up from scratch, then it's pretty much 2,000 gold pieces per spell level per week. So read that. Per spell level per week. So if it's a third level spell, that's 6,000. If you don't have all of the bits and pieces and everything else. And this is where, again, from the point of view of the, what the Dungeon Master needs to work out, Joining a wizard's guild, a sorcerer's guild, the magic users, special club, the independent order of odd fellows, whatever it is that you're trying to create, you build these little units that will be able to support the magic user. There will be an expectation that they'll give something back, and that's what this is all about. So they might say, yep, you can use our facilities, but guess what? You've got to write your spell inside out list, so then we'll have access to it. Which is fine, because they get to make a new spell anyway. And you get experience points for it. We love it. And that's why you've got the, the wizards just in, sitting in their little things going scribble, scribble, scribble all the time in all of the movies and the books and everything else. Because magic users like to get experience without having to go out and start killing things. But it does require a lot of money. A lot of money. So remember that, it's per level per week. So it's pretty groovy. So once we've got a bucket load of cash, and we've got the time, so you've got your um, second or third level, sp you've got your third level spell, say. So you've got your three weeks of uh, preparation that you've got sorted with the party, so it might be between adventures or it might be um, in a campaign where it's just between people getting healing up if it takes a month for a fighter to heal up, what does the magic user do in that time? Hey, it's a good time to investigate and research a new spell. They just can't be disturbed. Once they start, they've got to keep going, and they cannot be stopped or disturbed. Alright, so we, they really do need a good library. Which can be obviously gathered from their adventuring, their dungeoning, dungeoneering, and ransacking other magic users' lairs. So the chances of success. This is what we're after. So the base chance is 10%. Plus the intelligence score of the researcher as a magic user or an illusionist. Wisdom if it's a cleric or a druid. Plus the level, minus twice the level of the spell. So you're researching a third level spell, that's minus six. So 10% plus the intelligence. So if you've got 16 intelligence, 26%, and you're a fifth level, 31 minus six, goes back to 26. So you've got a 26% chance straight up and don't forget, you've still got to spend the gold pieces per week, per level. Now you can increase that 10% base by doubling that cost. So whatever the, the doubling of the cost is. And away we go to a maximum of 50%. So there is a nice little example in here. If I can just get it there. 8,000 gold pieces gets you a 50% base. Then you have your intelligence, 
then you have your level minus twice the spell level. That 50%, it really, really bumps it up. That's a buff. So levels are almost as important as your uh, intelligence. You don't need a high intelligence, as in you don't need to be running around with 18 intelligence all the time. And this is what, when we talk about the character abilities, and a magic user goes, Oh no, I've only got a 15 intelligence. Well, that's still 15 intelligence. That still gives you plus 15% on spell research, which is pretty good. And then it's your level. Notice there's no minimum level. No minimum level. There's just a way of saying that the magic the dungeon master can say to the magic user, no, it's not successful, and there's no chance of success. But you could be a first level magic user researching spells. If you have enough gold. Remember the base chance increases with the less resources you have. So if you're a part of a guild, you've got your library, you've got your research lab, then all of that comes down and so on. Yeah, so there's a bit of work for the DM to work out some of these things, but this is what being a player should be about right here. I'm going to make my own spell. And as we said before, there's no percentage chance to know the spell. You just know it because you've made it. So if you've got your um, 15 intelligence with your 65% chance of knowing a spell that you find, you're going to want to research Fireball rather than try and find the scroll of Fireball and learn it. But anyway, again, it depends entirely on what the Dungeon Master does with these characters, if they do how they do magic. If you do one part, you need to allow for a lot of other parts to, to sort of come through, and that's where it gets tricksy. Some players just don't bother with spell research. But you could actually have a utility spell that allows you to open locks, not just knock down doors, and all sorts of, you know, just little things that you'd like to do in an adventure in a dungeon. So for a cleric it's a similar sort of thing. If they want to make up a new spell, then it's the 10% plus the wisdom plus the level, minus, twice, and so on. Their need to make new spells is a lot less, but it's still entirely possible. They might want to make a, a more of an altered version of a lower level spell for a higher level purpose. And yes. And then how that gets disseminated around the world once it's available to the cleric, and if the cleric has created a new spell, then perhaps the deity might allow that to go to the other clerics of the faith. There might be a, a price to be paid, because as they have to, their libraries and their shrines would have to be obviously to the, the deity or the pantheon that they're involved with. Again, a few things that the DM needs to have sorted but that's all right. Well and truly capable. Every dungeon master can do it. You just gotta think about it. And this isn't something that the DMs walk around saying, here, do this, players. The players need to come to the DM and say, I wanna to start to do this. We'll talk about assassins a bit later, but there's a particular thing, and it even says in big bold letters, do not tell them they can do this unless they ask about this. That one weird trick, etc. So it requires a fair bit of rulesing, but it's excellent. And it adds a little bit of... Um, I, I found it exciting as a DM when a player wanted to do it. Because for me, it meant that the player was getting involved in the universe that they were, being cre that they were creating. 
they were part of it. It just sort of, it, it, it's just a bit of a buy-in. Not just, I want to create a spell that does this and is powerful and kills everybody, but it sort of adds that little bit of flavour. And occasionally I have a, I like to have a, a bad guy magic user who's just been making spells and supplying them to to enemies and opponents like a, an arms dealer with <laughs> for magic. Alright, so that's making a new spell. Okay, so magic potions are the next up. And at 7th level, a magic user is able to begin to collect ingredients in order to make a potion. Alright, so pretty much what we're looking at, again, time and money. But this also has requirements for ingredients, which sort of makes a reason for adventuring. It's just some suggestions. They're not saying you need to have this. Not every healing potion is made of Ogre Magi blood or a thread of a saint's garment. It's just something you need to do. You need to go out and get things. The moment you start saying, right, I want to do a potion, I want to start building potions, you need to start collecting weird bits of things. Every time when you kill a monster, what can I make this use of this monster for? I need its brains, its glands, what do I need? So, that's pretty much where it goes. So at 7th level you can start to do this with the help of an alchemist. And it also assumes that you've got enough money and you need a fully functioning lab. The alchemist doesn't come with a lab, that'll be extra. But a good magic user should start to put their lab together, and their workshop together. And you've got to have a weekly uh, costs for that and you need to fit it out with all sorts of measuring devices and jugs and all the right scales and flasks and dishes and fireplaces and heats and so on all that sort of everything but remember you can you need an alchemist now how do we get an alchemist we go back do you remember when we talked about hirelings What's the first one there? Alchemist. So just the alchemist alone is 300 gold pieces a month. As a base. Remember, this isn't an exact. This is a base. It depends on the needs and everything else. So once you get to 11th level, you no longer need uh, an alchemist. But if you have one, then the time is reduced by half. You still have to have a fully functioning lab and you still got to get it out and everything else. So at 11th level, for those of you who aren't in the know, or who have forgotten, that's the maximum that an elf can become, an elf magic user. That's kind of important. So they don't need a magic, they don't need an alchemist to make potions. But if they have one, Time is halved. So the length of time to make one is based on the actual potion cost here. And the number of weeks rounded up. So 250 becomes three weeks. 400. So if you're making a Flying potion. It's eight weeks. Seven hundred and fifty becomes eight weeks. And that's pretty cool. So a flying potion seems pretty really reasonable. Hippogriff feathers and wyvern blood. There you go. You just got to find a wyvern. 
Cue the weapon. Uncommon, 1 to 6. Hit die 7 plus 7. 2 attacks. Yeah, poison. Alright, so you got to not only kill it, but then drain it of its blood to make the potion. And then go find a hippogriff and just steal its feather. Cool, huh? So the magic user says, and it's got to be a magic user, it's not a cleric. I don't think in this one. It only, any magic user. There you go. So this is, the magic user says I want to build a potion. Fine, where's your lab? I don't have one. Right, let's make a lab. What do you need? Yep, let's stock it. Let's buy the product. Let's get the kit. Go and get your own little basic chemistry set. You go buy an alchemist for a month or two. Go out hunting for all the ingredients. Who doesn't love a good beholder eye? You, they're, they're, there's so much. The beholders do so many. <laughs> Every scrap of a beholder is, is part of an ingredient for something. So <laughs> no wonder they're always expecting, you know, they're, they're so paranoid about being killed. So we have our percentage chance of success, which, if we have a look, you will see there isn't one. Do you know why? Because you make it. That's right. You just make the potion. So now you're saying, why aren't I always making potions? Well, it just takes a couple of weeks and you too could have a potion. As long as you've got all the ingredients. And this is where there's usually a special ingredient. And that's what this is referring to. There's like a special thing that uh, the, the DM can say, yeah, okay, you want to have a, make some healing potions, then you need to have some of this. Go and get some trolls blood. So that's it. You've got to go hunt out some trolls or something. You've got to do something like that. And you'll need one special ingredient to go and make the potion that makes it that particular type of potion. If it's going to be a water breathing, you might need something specific. They've got water naga blood. Yeah, fair enough. Or Nixie organs. Poor Nixie. The poor Nixie. We're going to just use all your organs. So anyway, that's making potions. In a nutshell, seventh level with an alchemist. Spend a bucket load of gold. Collect some ingredients. Go out on an adventure. Pick up some things. And come back a few weeks later. You've got your potion. Cool. And you get the experience points of that potion as well. And you can create brand new potions for the exact same thing. Yeah, it's not like you have to stick with the potions that are in the DM's guide. It's just that the, those potions are obviously ones that we know. But if there's another potion type that you want to do, then you can make that. And again, same deal. So you can start to be a bit more prolific. And this is where I say that the magic user becomes part of the, the world. In that these magical items start to, and spells, start to actually permeate. And people go, who's making these things? We either want him on our side, or her on our side, or we want him or her destroyed. So the next spot we're looking at, scrolls. So these are uh, some of the protection scrolls that you can be made. So protection scrolls require the character to sit down and make these very specific scrolls because they're they're not like a, a spell scroll these are protection scrolls that can be used by everybody so they can each make protection scrolls and then you have spell scrolls 
So, to do a, a scroll of any sort, you need the paper, which comes in specialist levels. So if you have an excellent material, vellum per sheet. So the way that a scroll initially works is that you have a percentage chance of failure, and then everything else adjusts that. So to start writing spell scrolls, or scrolls of any sort, you have to be 7th level or higher. So the magical 7. Which puts half elves in an interesting spot because they obviously can only get to some of these 7th, 8th levels if they've got high enough stats. And they can't become a 7th um, level cleric at any st in any rate. So Elves, obviously, humans, gnomes for the illusionists. So you've got your quality of your paper. You have to make your ink, because your ink is very important. And again, this is where the cost for the ink comes in, and the DM needs to work that out. And what needs to happen to make the ink. Once you've got a blob of ink, then that can be a certain amount of... Uh, scrolls made with it. Entirely up to the DM. All of this is in, it's not written anywhere in terms of how it's done, it's just the DM needs to do it. So you need to go and get stuff. So for instance, this one is a petrification spell, and they've got, make sure they've got a basilisk. Yeah. So you got to go hunt stuff. You're going to kill things, or Medusa's snakes, and things like that, right? So... They want to try and get you, to give you a reason to go out an adventure to pick things. You're going shopping. You don't just put a list together, go down to the local garden market and pick out your uh, Beholder Eye Stalk or um, the Ica of a Squeeder or something. Or maybe you can for some of the more mundane items. So once you've got all of your ink and you've got your paper, then you just need time. And this is where Mr. Gygax is shouting at us. Preparation requires one full day for each level of the spell being scribed in the scroll. So there you go. So first level spell takes one day to sue, second level two, etc. Then we get to our percentage chance of failure, which is a base 20% failure. So you roll the percentile and 0, 1 to 20, fail. And that's assuming that there's a chance of a, a, a smudge or a flaw in the parchment. And if you've got a long enough piece of parchment, you can have multiple spells on a single scroll. But you have to do this percentage chance for each spell. So that's 20% plus 1 per level of spell. Which means for a magic user, it's obviously between 21 and 29, and for a cleric, it's between 21 and 27. Then, minus the level. And the scroll is written at your spell level, like at your level. So you've got to know the spell. You can't just sort of make a spell up. Well, that's where we do the research, but this is... If you're wanting to create a scroll for some of the spells that you have, but aren't worth having as slots which could be things like read magic to allow you to read scrolls or detect magic things that the utility spells that are just like well we're not going to have this laying around in my i'm not going to waste a slot but i'll carry three scrolls of knock that sort of thing i'll have uh, two scrolls of uh, magic missile at seventh level or i'll have a couple of scrolls of uh, fireball because reading a scroll is uh, just the one segment as opposed to casting the spell identify scroll you get it all sorted out put it in the scroll and then you don't have to worry about all of the other negatives for casting the spell you've got it as a scroll you just got to be seventh level as a magic user to do it so the failure just means things just it just doesn't work. So as it says here, 14th level cleric attempting to write a 7th level spell. It's 20 plus 7 minus 14 for a 13% chance of failure. 
So you've got a strong chance of success. And then, of course, modified by the quality of the paper. And the DM could easily modify it by the quality of the ink. So that's all of that. Writing scrolls just takes a few days. So again, you've got time between um, adventures or you've got uh, that in a campaign, the fighters have to heal for a few more days. They've just got to lay low. The thieves have to do their thing and research for a, a target. So what does the magic user do? The magic user begins the process of inscribing a scroll. And of course you get the experience points. So that's pretty good. Scrolls are a little bit easier to make for a magic user really, I suppose. But they they need to. Once you get to seventh level, you need to start putting you need to start putting things down in paper. Good quality paper. All right, so this is about making magic items of all sorts. So whether it's caps, rings, shirts, armor, swords, weapons, etc., etc., etc. All right. First of all, we'll talk about non-magic users. So clerics, druids, and illusionists have their own process, and which is separate from the magic user process, which is different. Usually they're the same and you're just swapping one for the other, but in this instance they are different. Starting with illusionists, why not? Because it's right in front of me. It has to be 11th level. 11th level. Now, the first thing is with any item, it's got to be of the finest quality. The item has to be of the finest quality, which means it costs. And that's the key. Everything is always about cost. It needs to spend a bucket load of money to make sure that it is the best quality. And it could be thousands upon thousands to make sure that it is as what, close to perfection as you possibly can. That is the same across all of them. Now, illusionists, 11th level. They have to use a major creation spell. And that allows them to use a one-shot item. Just a one-shot so if you wanted to just make a, a single, not just not a scroll, obviously, because that's the seventh level, but something that stores like a ring of spell storing, or if you just want to do a wand of some description, or a wand of illusion, or if you wanted to create a, a very limited uh, illusion item, then that's major creation and being 11th level. The key to all of these not only is it about to having the most, the nicest looking thing and the best quality of product, you've got to write it all down and make sure that you've given it all to the DM because the DM has to approve all of these things, obviously. The players have to work with the Dungeon Master in order to make all of this happen. And they, because creating a magic item can upset the balance of a game, it can upset the balance of a campaign, it can upset the balance of a local area. And it's important to know these. So, 11th level illusionist does that. Major create, because it's one of their spells. But at 14th level, you can make a permanent with an alter reality. And you can even do a plus one dagger. Maximum of plus one. So, that sort of thing. So if you wanted to do some other item as an example, you great expense in time and money and preparation, major creation, altered reality and true sight spells, an unflawed gem, you can create a gem of sinning. So that that's what it costs. You gotta go out hunting for it, you gotta go out that's your adventure. So then these can be anything, these items. Even though they've got a special thing for non-standard magic items, but it's pretty much the exact same process. It's just that you can write it all down, make sure it's all correct. So you can copy or do similar to what's already in existence. 
or something brand new. And then that's where, you, again, if it's already something in um, that's in existence, you just sort of look at that. Uh, I want to do something that makes me invisible. Well, that's sort of like invisibility. Whatever, it's going to run with all the same invisibility caveats. I want something that's shape-shifting or polymorphing. I want an amulet of gaze reflection that's permanent. Done. Tell me that's not useful. And now we're on to clerics. So clerics and druids, 11th level, quality of the highest order. Everything is got to be good. Now, what we have to remember here, clerics and dru druids making an item which is applicable to their profession must spend a fortnight in retreat, meditating, and in complete isolation. Thereafter, he or she must spend a send night fasting. All right, for those of you who were born after the 1600s, a send night means seven days and seven nights. So seven days and seven nights. So, so finally, he or she must pray and purify the item, etc., bless and so on, or do it right. And here we go. Because they don't have to do the same sort of levels of spells and everything else, they get this other beautiful thing where it's 1% per day, cumulative, that the item will then be empowered. So if you have your really beautiful ring that you're going to fill with your holy aura and have it as a permanent bless, item, you know, or something or whatever, then it's 1% per day. So, there you go. How many days are you spending? And just keep doing it. And you've just got to um, be in isolation and keep praying over it. So eventually it happens. Because, obviously, after 60, 50, 60 days, you've got the most chance of... Yeah, so... And that's what it's about. It's about time. And that's why the DM needs to be involved in this because you could easily have high level clerics and they're humans obviously because humans are the only ones that can make it to those sorts of levels running around making items. It's quite physically taxing. So m druids, clerics, Illusionists, 11th level. And they have their little bit of a process. Alright, magic users. You get the short end of this stick, I'm sorry folks. You gotta be 12th level. There's a beautiful reason for that. Do you remember what the level of a cler the level of a magic user a thief could get, uh, an elf could get up to? Yep, 11th. So they can't get to do this unless they're very, very special. Because an elf that lives for 2,000 years and has plenty of time is going to make a bucket load of magic items. Bucket load. So you're going to be 12th level. And for this, it's a matter of, well, it's casting spells, isn't it? Permanency spell and it's enchanting an item. They've got the actual spells to do it. So for them, it's just easy. It's all in the player's handbook. He even says so. Player's handbook. Right there. So enchant an item in permanency. I have to still have the very expensive products and so on. So time and money and levels. Twelfth level making items for a magic user. 11th level making items for cleric, druid, illusionist. 7th level for all of them to write scrolls. Magic user from 7th level has the ability to make potions. And they can all build spells at any level. So there you go. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So that is the fabrication and the making of magical research. So something we might just finally touch on in this section. And we're flipping. 
this bit here creation of holy and unholy water this is very much the domain of the clerics excluding druids are able to do this you've got to have a basin made of the best metal spent the most and all of that sort of thing away we go so here we go look at that so you need copper silver elect and if it's a combination then it sits in between so if it's not a pure platinum perfectly created font of that then it's less so if it's something between gold and platinum like if it's gold with platinum inlays then it starts to fit between it's half of that value plus half of that value font costs yeah etc so yeah so it this is where time and money you can't constantly just produce holy water because the process is so lengthy and what is the process it's really quite simple it's really quite simple bunch of spells specially made thing and that's it you only do this whole thing once per week like as in all of like making all of this so you might think yeah I can do this all once but I can make 18 vials of holy water once a week yeah, it's also very taxing and it means that you're limited to what you can do afterwards there's a lot of spiritual energy that's flowing through the cleric but um, all up it's pretty much the same thing and all this is the same in reverse for holy for unholy water so again let's have a look at these so the cleric has to do the following create water purify food and drink the water Bless, chant, and prayer. So over the clerics. Bless. Purify food and drink. Create water. Three first level spells. Second level spell, chant. And third level spell prayer you got to do it all in rapid succession you can't just sort of come back day after day you've got to all do it in the one hit so in the one day you're using three first level spells second level spell and a third level spell and then once you've done that you've able to uh, make some holy water is just what we need you've got to do all of this of course in your um, spiritual accoutrement in your religious ceremony because this uses a third level spell remember when we're talking about clerical spells the first few levels of spells are mostly ceremonial they're not so much always about the pantheon or the god giving the the uh, the magic energy it's their spiritual prayer so even a fifth level half elf can make some holy water that's nice they're not left out of everything it's good to include people we like including Okay, so that's one last look at this. Remember it takes weeks for these things to be made, so it's time and money, time and money, time and money. Right, so hopefully I've um, helped out with the fabrication of magic items and the magical research, specifically new spells and scrolls.
which is probably where most people will be jumping at the chance now to get in and start making things happen. So this is all roughly around page 114, the DM's guide, for those of you who are playing at home. Like, subscribe, all the good bits. Thanks for coming. And I enjoy hearing comments about spells that you guys have created, or uh, scrolls, or things that went wrong, or things that went right. Always, war stories are always good. Everyone loves a good war story. I got a few. It's funny. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate you watching.